M S W Media. They might be giants have been on the road for too long. Too long. And they might be giants aren't even sorry. Not even sorry. And audiences like the shows too much. Too much. And now they might be giants are playing their breakthrough album Flood. All of it. And they still have time for other songs. They're fooling around. Who can stop They Might Be Giants and their liberal rock agenda? Who? No one. This ad was paid for with somebody else's money. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Friday, February 24th, 2023. Today, the special counsel files a motion to compel Mike Pence to testify pursuant to a subpoena issued in January. Harvey Weinstein is sentenced to another 16 years in prison. A January 6th rioter who threatened AOC has been sentenced to three years in prison. A judge rules that Trump and Chris Ray can be deposed by Pete Strzok and Lisa Page. And Steve Bannon is being sued by his own lawyers. I'm your host, Allison Gill. Hey, everybody, it's AG. Uh, Just want to let you know there's no happy hour tonight and there's not going to be a happy hour next week either. We're going to go two weeks after that because I will be out of town next week. Just wanted to give you a heads up. Today, I'll be joined by Greg Oliar in the B Block to talk about the news I'm about to read to you. And I want to thank everybody. The indictments only Twitter account that I created 24 hours ago has 17,000 followers. (laughs) So I, you know, everybody, whenever I post news like Ivanka and Jared have been subpoenaed or a special counsel Jack Smith is going to try to compel Pence's testimony, I always get a ton of replies saying, whatever, I don't care, just wake me up when he's indicted. So just for everyone, I created a Twitter account at indictments only. And all it does is tell you when there's indictments. So if you want to follow it on Twitter at indictments only. Turn on notifications. You'll be notified when there's an indictment. That way I don't have to keep track of everyone. I need to wake up when there's an indictment. So anyway, 17,000 followers in 24 hours. You guys are amazing. Seriously, I can't thank you enough. And if you want to become a patron of this show, you can go to patreon.com slash Mueller She Wrote. If you sign up at the $5 level, you also get to become a patron and get the ad-free feed of the Jack podcast. And we do have a lot of Jack Smith news to get to today. I'll cover it a little bit. And then, of course, we'll get into it in detail over the weekend on the next episode. So I hope you're enjoying that podcast. I really love making it with Andy McCabe. And I've got another podcast with Pete Strzok called Clean Up on Aisle 45. You can find that for free and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. I look forward to seeing you there as well. The first episode with Pete Strzok is out now. Again, it's called Clean Up on Aisle 45. And you can become a patron of that podcast by going to patreon.com slash aisle 45 pod, A-I-S-L-E 45 P-O-D. All right. Dana is going to be back on Tuesday with us. But like I said, I got Greg Oliar from the Prevail podcast to join me later to talk about the news. So let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right. From Hugo Lowell at The Guardian, the special counsel investigating Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election issued a motion to compel testimony from Mike Pence in recent days. And this is after the Trump legal team sought to block his appearance on executive privilege grounds. That's according to sources familiar. The compulsion motion against Pence marks a preemptive move by the special counsel to rebut the executive privilege arguments before Pence has even made an appearance before the federal grand jury in D.C. pursuant to the subpoena issued last month. Now, while Pence has suggested he would contest the subpoena, The Guardian previously reported that it's understood to involve him at least appearing before the grand jury and asserting the so-called speech or debate protection for congressional officials to very specific questions. So he's going to do what you're supposed to do. Show up because you've been subpoenaed. And my understanding is, I mean, this was sent out in January, so it should be sometime soon. He's going to show up and answer questions that aren't protected by the speech or debate clause, but then invoke the speech or debate clause for certain questions that are. The Trump special counsel, Jack Smith, however, appears to have issued the motion to compel, which was reported by CBS News not in response to Pence's expected actions, not in response to the speech or debate clause, but in response to recent executive privilege motions filed in the case by Trump's legal team seeking to stop Pence from testifying at all. Trump's legal team has reflexively filed executive privilege motions to stop multiple former Trump White House officials from testifying in the criminal investigation. 
That has led to protracted litigation with federal prosecutors before the chief judge in the District of Columbia, Beryl Howell. The executive privilege fight with Pence's chief of staff, Mark Short, took at least four months. That is thought to have delayed parts of the investigation. Howell, who has generally ruled in favor of the government on executive privilege disputes, even if they do take months to resolve, is slated to step down on March 16th. She will be replaced as the chief judge by James Bosberg, who previously oversaw the secret, the for the FISC, the Foreign Surveillance Court. Now, the Spence subpoena is more complicated than other legal battles over executive privilege because there are two privilege assertions at play here. Pence's own expected speech or debate assertions, as well as the standard executive privilege fight by the Trump legal team. Now, whether the special counsel filed the motion to compel in response to the Trump legal team in order to deal with the privilege issues sequentially, executive privilege is also a generally weaker protection than the speech or debate clause. That's not clear. And a spokesman did not respond to a request for comment. We're going to be talking with MSNBC legal analyst Lisa Rubin on this Sunday's episode of Jack with me and Andy McCabe. And I'm going to ask if Jack Smith even needs Pence's testimony to prosecute. We're also going to discuss the Scott Perry phone access hearing. As you know, back in August, the DOJ seized Scott Perry's phone and now he's fighting the second search warrant to get at the contents of that phone. There was a hearing today about it in the D.C. appellate court in front of Katsis, Rao and Henderson two Trump appointees and a GW appointee. That hearing happened today. They can go on bonk if this particular panel uh, rules against the Department of Justice. And we're going to talk all about that Perry hearing on the next episode of Jack. And from Spencer Hsu at The Post, a federal judge Thursday ordered that the former guy and FBI Director Chris Wray can be depositioned under oath by attorneys for two former senior FBI employees who allege in separate lawsuits that they were illegally targeted for retribution after the FBI investigated Russia's interference in the 2016 election. This is a decision by District Judge Amy Berman. Judge Jackson, if you're nasty. This came in consolidated lawsuits against the FBI and the Justice Department by former senior FBI agent Pete Strzok, my co-host on Clean Up on Out 45, and former FBI lawyer Lisa Page, who exchanged politically charged text messages criticizing Trump while they were having an affair. Now, Strzok seeks reinstatement and back pay over what he alleges was unfair termination. Page alleges officials unlawfully released the trove of messages to reporters. Jackson issued her ruling in the four-year-old lawsuits after attorneys for Strzok and Page showed they had completed interviews of lower-ranking officials and exhausted potential sources of information other than the former president and Chris Wray. Quote, the court authorized the plaintiffs to conduct depositions of each witness that do not exceed two hours and are limited to the narrow set of topics specified. That's what she ruled in a minute order on Thursday. Proceedings are sealed, so the substance of those depositions are secret, although Jackson said that a public transcript will be released later after removing references to any deposition testimony. Jackson gave the Justice Department until March 24th to decide whether to invoke executive privilege on Trump's behalf to shield the confidentiality of a president's communications with top advisors under the Constitution's separation of powers. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, And a January 6th rioter who threatened Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez on social media after having participated in the January 6th attack on the Capitol was sentenced Wednesday to 38 months in prison. Prosecutors had asked for 48 months for Garrett Miller, an unemployed Texan who they noted was wearing a T-shirt bearing President Donald Trump's picture and the words, I was there, Washington, D.C., January 6, 2021, when he was arrested weeks after the attack. Miller's defense lawyer has asked for a sentence of 30 months, which would essentially be time served because he's been locked up since his arrest in late January of 2021. Now, the Fed said the higher sentence was warranted in part because of his threat to Ocasio-Cortez. Now, Ocasio-Cortez has tweeted the word uh, impeach after the riot, to which Miller responded, assassinate AOC. That was the threat. In addition to prison time, U.S. District Judge Carl Nichols ordered 36 months of supervised release afterwards, according to the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. Miller's lawyer, Clint Broden, praised the judge for his careful consideration of the case and noted the sentence was significantly less than the sentence sought by the government. He said his client had expressed his sincere remorse. Quote, it should always be remembered that although Garrett is fully responsible for his individual actions that day, his actions and the actions of many others were a product of the rhetoric from a cult leader that has yet to be brought to justice. That's what this guy's lawyer said. Miller of Richardson, Texas, pled guilty to 11 counts, including assaulting, resisting or impeding officers during the riot, 
interstate threat to injure or kidnap for his Ocasio-Cortez threat, and entering or remaining in a restricted building. That story was from Daryl Gregorian at NBC. All right, time for a little schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. I can't let you go to the weekend without a little schadenfreude. This is from our friend Adam Klasfeld at Law and Crime. Former Trump strategist Steve Bannon owes more than $480,000 to the law firm that represented him over the course of two federal prosecutions, one of which ended with a presidential pardon and the other with a conviction. The law firm, Davidoff, Hutcher, and Citron LLP, claims that Bannon stiffed his legal team on the bulk of his $855,000 legal bill. Bannon paid $375,000 of the tab, leaving $480,000 outstanding. That's according to the firm's lawsuit. Bannon remains in legal hot water and not just for contract disputes. He has a pending criminal case in state court accusing him of defrauding donors in the We Build the Wall scheme, a crowdfunding effort to build a barrier along the U.S.-Mexico border. These are similar allegations that inspired a related federal prosecution that he was pardoned for, along with three other co-defendants. Two of Bannon's co-defendants, Brian Colfage and Andrew Botolato, pled guilty to the allegations. The final co-defendant, Tim Shea, pressed his luck at trial, securing a mistrial before his first federal jury, before getting convicted on the second time. All three of those men are awaiting sentencing. Only Bannon dodged criminal liability in that case on the federal level through Trump's pardon. He's also the only erstwhile defendant in that case who worked in Trump's administration. Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg pursued similar charges on the state level, citing the exception under Jeopardy law for prosecutions by separate sovereigns. The trial in that case is currently slated for November of this year. And a little justice by proxy and a content warning here for sexual assault and rape. My rapist was never brought to justice. So when others get brought to justice, I get a little bit of justice for myself. I call it justice by proxy. And today, Harvey Weinstein, the movie producer whose treatment of women propelled the Me Too movement in 2017, was sentenced on Thursday to 16 years in prison for committing sex crimes in Los Angeles County. Weinstein was ordered to serve the L.A. sentence after finishing the 23-year sentence he's currently serving for sexual assault convictions in New York in 2020. The sentencing on Thursday all but ensures that the 70-year-old former Hollywood mogul, who is in declining health, will spend the rest of his life in prison. All right, we'll be right back with the host of the Prevail podcast and the 5-8 with my good friend Lincoln's Bible. It's Greg Oliar. Stay with us. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Harry Littman, host of the Talking Feds podcast, a weekly roundtable that brings together prominent figures from government law and journalism for a dynamic discussion of the most important topics of the day. Most news commentary is delivered in 90-second sound bites that just scratch the surface of a new development, not talking feds. Each Monday, I'm joined by a slate of feds' favorites and new voices to break down the headlines and give the insider's view of what's going on in Washington and beyond. We dig deep, but keep it fun. Plus sidebars detailing important legal concepts read by your favorite celebrities, such as Robert De Niro explaining whether the president can pardon himself, and Carol King explaining whether members of Congress can be disqualified from higher office. And music by Philip Glass. Find Talking Feds wherever you get your podcasts, and don't worry. As long as you need answers, the Feds will keep talking. So, Renato, do you still have your own podcast? Yeah, it's complicated. What's so complicated about a podcast? That's the name of the podcast, remember? Oh, will you still be exploring topics that help us understand the week's news? You bet. But we'll have a new name because we're going to be working together to explore complicated issues that are dominating the news. Working together? Yeah, you're hosting it with me, remember? Oh, right. Wait, does that mean our podcast is going to have a steam mop segment? Let's not get carried away but we'll discuss hot new legal topics. So check out our new episode coming soon to everywhere you get podcasts as well as YouTube. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Joining me today for thoughts on the news that I just read to you is my friend, host of the Prevail podcast, Got his own sub stack. Absolutely incredible writer and good friend, Greg Oliar. Hi, Greg. Hey, Allison. How's it going? Oh, you know, it's going good. Living the dream, as they say. That's always my stock reply, especially during quarantine. Whenever anybody asked me how I was doing, I'd be like, oh, just living the dream, you know. 
<laughs> and no one ever took it not sarcastically or ironically. Just good. Yeah, good. Because it's meant to be <laughs> ironic. Yeah. Yeah. It's like if I were drinking a PBR and wearing like a spam trucker hat and I say I live yeah. in the dream. That's yeah. that's exactly how it's meant to be taken. Yeah. And, you know, irony is officially dead. So it, it, it can be, it, you know, some people miss it and that's fine mm-hmm. and that's cool. But I am living the dream. So today we have all sorts of interesting news and we've even got a little bit of schadenfreude that we can you and I can just bask in the glory of if you want to. But I want to talk to you first about this whole <sighs> Pence. OK, everybody seems to be focused in on what he can testify, what he can't testify about. Will he testify? Is he going to come in? Is he going to come in and invoke speech or debate over certain questions? And then Trump's come in and he wants to assert executive privilege over all of it. And that'll probably get batted down. But, you know, I, I'm a I'm a big picture thinker. And, and I know we're going to go over this on the Jack podcast uh, this weekend, too. But like what is it that people want from Pence so badly that they can't get anywhere else? I mean, the only thing I can think of is that the phone calls with Pence, you know, um, but are those necessary for, for prosecution? I, I don't, I don't know if anybody's looking at this from a more pragmatic standpoint of if I were Jack Smith and the speech or debate argument is a, much better one than the executive privilege argument. Yes. At the very least, it it will probably go all the way to the Supreme Court. Could take months to a year to to resolve that issue, which we don't have. I mean, unless everybody votes Democrat in 2024, you know, we can because there some of this is on us. It's not up to one guy to save democracy. But like if I'm Jack Smith, am I going to wait around for that to prosecute if I've got tons of other stuff I can prosecute for? I I say no, but you know, what are your thoughts? I'm not really sure. I mean, you know, what, what the strategy is. My, my main question about Pence is why doesn't he want to uh, testify? Yeah. So, and, and um, because this is far and away the most heroic moment of his life. And he's presumably running for president. And Americans tend to like heroic people rather than people who are not heroic. They prefer heroes to cowards who run away generally, um, not all the time. So what's the deal with this? Why doesn't he want to uh, revisit what is his certainly his greatest moment as vice president of these United States? And I had um, on our on our show, the 5-8 that I do with our friend uh, LB on Friday, I had Tom LoBianco on and he wrote um, a book about Mike Pence, uh, Piety and Power, which is a really good book. And um, I asked him, like, what what's the deal with this guy? I don't understand. And he said, from the Republican standpoint, the idea is he wants to show that he can, he's fighting. He's fighting the system. He's taking it to the system. And that the Republican voters like the fact that he's like, well, here's mud in your eye, Jack Smith, even though it, it, the rest of the country seems not to want that. And that at least made sense to me. Like, it's not what I would do, but at least it, it, you know, it made some sense as to what his motives might be. I have long maintained that Mike Pence has been corrupted by Trump and knows enough of the stuff that happened in the White House that has to kind of go along with everything that that happens and probably doesn't want to testify because he's afraid of betraying Trump and, you know, something really bad happening to him. Something even worse than Trump sending an army of (laughs) besiegers to find him and kill him. Well, that and, and, you know, I can I could see like, well, I don't want to lose those Trump voters, but he doesn't have the Trump voters. Um, like if I was running for office, I'd be like, what kind of person do I need to be to have the most people like me? Mm-hmm. And when you have an opportunity to kind of be a hero, to be a and you're not even facing prison time here. This isn't like a right. a, a John Dean moment where he had to plead guilty to some shit and go to prison and came out you know, clean on the other side and now has great jobs and writes books and everybody loves him. I mean, it took a while, but, you know, he doesn't have, he's not even facing that. All he has to do is tell the truth about somebody who tried to kill him and somebody who's lost every single election. You know, I mean, let's be honest, he 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 did win the electoral college technically in 2016. But, you know, without the help of of Russia and Jim Comey, would he have? And like, he, I mean, he's a drag, he's an albatross on the party. So I don't understand the, with Trump, I get it. 
And Mary Trump and I talked about this. Trump can't be a hero because in order to be a hero, you have to admit that there's a problem, that there's something's wrong. And, and he just doesn't have the capacity to do that. But I, I don't understand. I'm with you. And that was the second big picture question I had, you know, because I mean, do we need the testimony about the phone call? Fonnie Willis didn't even call him in, didn't even subpoena Pence, doesn't need him. And those crimes that happen in Georgia can be prosecuted at a federal level under different, you know, 371 and obstructing official proceeding and all that jazz. So I don't see, first of all, that you need it. I, I would like to go through the exercise to find out if speech or debate clause applies to vice presidents counting electoral votes in this very specific narrow instance, just so we have it on the books. But I don't know if it's necessary for prosecution. But yeah, you're, you're right. To the bigger picture, you have a chance to actually get more people to like you than like you right now. And that's the only way to do it. Yeah. It's interesting. You were talking about about Trump and the voters. And uh, I, I thought, you know, to me, the big tell with Pence was during the impeachment, the first impeachment. Like at that time, it was in January, I believe, of, right, of 2020, kind of right before the pandemic. And everybody knew Trump was guilty. You know, all it took, all it would have taken was a couple of principled senators and Pence to kind of organize this hit and he would have been gone. Pence would have been president and had like nine months to turn stuff around. And if he was in charge during the pandemic, instead of like, you know, crook number one and genocidal son-in-law, uh, you know, maybe he would have. I mean, I don't. So why would the Republicans want that? Why would Pence not want that? That never made sense to me. And I had uh, months ago, I had Amanda Carpenter um, from The Bulwark on my show, on my podcast. And she said, they need the votes. They need Trump's votes. They have to have Trump's votes to win these elections. And I think the difference is that Trump, the voters there come from a place of grievance. They, they, they like Trump because he's sort of an avatar of their own personal grievances. And personal grievances are so powerful for a lot of these people who feel oh so aggrieved by their lives and these perceived slights against them. And Trump, they, they think he's the guy that's going to just, you know, take it to everybody that's done them wrong. He's like a, a, you know, Pence isn't like that. There's no grievance for Pence. He's just a, a, he's just a standard old fashioned politician in a sense where he's, you know, he's very conservative and kind of, you know, fascistic, but not in that same grievance based way, which right now, if you're, if you're a Republican is how you win elections. It looks like to me. Well, I mean, he does technically have a grievance. The dude tried to kill him. I mean, like, sure. I guess he, yeah. maybe he doesn't, maybe he's not into the grievance thing. But I mean, here we are saying he, he just wants to, here's mud in your eye, Jack Smith. But like, well, why don't put the mud in the eye of the guy who tried to kill you? I don't get it. And he would be able to make shit right with mother, right? Redeem himself in the eyes of mother because she hated Trump. She was like, I can't believe this. Fine, we'll go to fucking, we'll fly there. You know, and they let the air out of the tires so he couldn't leave, you know. (laughs) And it's like, like, hey, maybe, you know, maybe she'll she'll sleep with you again. Uh, I don't know. I I just, I don't understand it at all. But uh, we're going to, we're going to dive into the legality of all the you know, the different privilege claims when we talk uh, to Lisa Rubin on Jack this Sunday. But I, I just wanted to get your sort of overall impression. And and uh, yeah, I'm with you. Why is he even resisting this? You know, I, I, t- I tweeted out earlier, like there are men and women, there are people who have risked everything, who have sacrificed everything for this country. And all we're asking you to do is answer some fucking questions, man. You know, sack up. All right. Or puss up, I should say. Right. <laughs> Next up, we have uh, what I call justice by proxy. Uh, Harvey Weinstein has been sentenced to another 16 years in federal prison for uh, crimes in uh, California. because I believe he's serving 23 years uh, for for his crimes in New York by coastal predator here and now by coastal convict. Yeah, good, good. Um, You know, the whole Harvey Weinstein thing to me, it sort of, when the story came out, how insidious it was and long lasting and how many people it affected really boggles the mind. I mean, it's so upsetting. And when you consider the people that were uh, impacted by it are famous, rich people who you think would have power. And I think the main takeaway from that, you know, for me is if these people aren't powerful enough to stop the predators, then what about the people that aren't, you know, rich, famous actresses? 
you know, what about them? Because they don't have any power at all. People don't believe them. They, you know, slut shame them, the whole, the whole thing. And the, the percentage of, of rapes that get even uh, uh, indicted is so pathetically small. It's, you know, it's a disgrace. So I think that he is awful. Obviously, he's uniquely horrible, just a, just a, a horrific man in every way, shape and form. But from a, a societal sense, I like seeing these predators go to jail for, for, for this. Uh, it's something we need to do a better job with as a society and protect our and protect people, protect people that are vulnerable. We're doing a, a terrible job. I think I sound like Trump. We're just doing a terrible job in society. But we are <laughs> no, protecting, no, we're protecting uh, vulnerable populations. You know, you see it with the trans stuff that's going on in these state houses in, in Tennessee, in Montana, in these places where to me, anti-drag that's anti-drag bills, anti-trans yeah. bills, anti- it's yeah, everything. encroaching fascism. And but these are. You know, there. I know that get that it's culture wars, but ultimately it's a population that is vulnerable and needs the protection of society. It doesn't need the opposite. It doesn't need to be targeted by society. So I feel like, you know, groups of people that are vulnerable need to be protected more. The good societies, that's what, that's what good societies do. And, uh, this is a, this is a win for civilization, putting this asshole behind bars longer. Yeah. I also enjoy watching powerful, rich, white men. What, you know, watching Murdoch cry on the stand today was not, it was a nice break for me. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's good to see. Uh, and so I'm, I'm glad it happened, but you know, you're right. Like I, I experienced it too. When I, when I experienced military sexual assault, I was in an Oscar nominated film about military sexual assault. So my claim got adjudicated, albeit 15 years after the fact, but my claim got got adjudicated. And, and that's why I went to work for the VA is I was like, yeah, but I, you know, not everybody gets to be in an Oscar nominated movie. What about the thousands and thousands of veterans, men and women, people, uh, everyone uh, who have, have suffered this, who don't get that kind of attention because uh, because of it. And so it is good and comforting. That's why I call it justice by proxy, because yeah. my my attacker will never see justice. So when others do, I, I, I keep a little bit for myself. Yeah, no, and, and, and you should. And I don't want to minimize the, the you know, what he did to the actresses is also horrible. It's horrible oh, yeah. for everybody involved. And I don't want to minimize it. But it, to me, the, that's the takeaway is, my God, this is such a problem. It's such And a the problem. actresses see it too. They're like, we're famous actresses, you know. Um, yeah. What about everybody else? Uh, let's switch to a little bit of uh, of happy news because, well, I mean, it is happy news that he went to prison um, or he, he's in prison and got his, got his shit extended by another 16 years. He will die in prison. The uh, judges ruled that Chris Ray and my good buddy Pete Strzok, he gets to depose Chris Ray and Donald Trump. I saw that. In the lawsuits. I saw that. And I, I think that now that... Uh, Fucking DOJ better not step in here and try to exert any privilege or I'm going to be like, come on, throw me a bone because, you know, I like to defend institutions. But I, I'm hoping that Pete Strzok and Lisa Page get these two hour depositions from from these two, Chris Ray and Donald Trump himself. I'm particularly interested to read Chris Ray's deposition because that guy's been so mm-hmm. tight lipped. And, you know, again, w- we have to go back and really revisit what happened, which is that. Donald Trump fired Comey because Comey was investigating him. And then the next day bragged about it with the two high level Russians that he brought into the fucking Oval Office and told them, hey, this is going to be OK now. We're, uh, you know, got him off our back and then brought in Chris Ray. So I don't understand why the guy who fired the FBI director who was investigating him then gets to pick the new FBI director. I mean, I don't know anything about Chris Ray other than I think his record has been pretty fucking awful, but, uh, you know, he hasn't exactly redeemed himself in my eyes, but like Mm, just the fact that Trump picked him under those circumstances means he should have been fired day one. And uh, I don't understand why he hasn't. been. So I'm very, very curious to see uh, him explain himself under oath. Yeah. And this, uh, I think, particularly uh, has to do with the release of the text messages, their their personal and private text messages. And, you know, that was uh, Rosenstein and Department of Justice. And did Trump have anything to do with that? And did Chris Ray have anything to do with that? Because they, you know, they 
let them come in. They let everybody come. These reporters come in, read these text messages uh, in a in a skiff, and then and skedaddle. And that was all set up by I think I think Rosenstein. And so it'll be interesting. I'm I'm also very interested to see what Chris Ray has to say. I wish they could ask him quite a few more questions about <laughs> 4,500 unanswered tips in Kavanaugh case. I mean, I know technically why those didn't get investigated, but come on. So I'd just be uh, very interesting to see what happens there. And then, of course, you know, security on January 6th. What happened there? Yeah, there's a lot. There's definitely a lot. Oh, the, then then the McGonagall thing. There's a lot. There's a lot that he has, <laughs> has to explain for. Him, so, yeah. 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 And I mean, I get trying to go back to normal, having a normal 10 year FBI director, but like nothing out of that whole era was normal. This is not normal times. These aren't normal times, you know. Correct. Yeah. Let him go work for a Russian oligarch like they do when they retire. It's a great thing to do. Yeah. Deripaska is hiring. Uh, McGonagall is going to be in trouble. So. <laughs> Uh, All right. Uh, Next up. And finally, this is just great. Uh, Steve Bannon is being sued for about half a million dollars by his legal team. And that just I don't know, that just warms the cockles of my heart. You know, here's the thing, though. I don't know who his lawyers are. I'm sure they're really nice people. But what are you doing being the lawyer for Steve Bannon? I don't have sympathy for you. You know, if if you take this client on and you really expect him to play. I mean, what are you thinking? What what are you doing? I don't know. I don't get it. I just hear uh, Ben Affleck in Goodwill Hunting retainer. You know, <laughs> that's all I hear. That, like that go, too, you know, and, go Chris and, uh, Kai's on him and be like, "I'm going to need three million up front to even fucking talk to you." They can't even put this guy in jail after he's been convicted of a crime. They're, they really expect him to take the checkbook out. Come on, yeah. yeah. Good luck, guys. Have fun with that. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's you know. I, I don't know. I mean, he does have the money. He's got a pretty serious trial. He's got a pretty serious trial coming up toward the end of the year in the in the fall, end of fall. So, uh, and that's the Manhattan DA's indictments for the We Build the Wall scheme, which he was pardoned mm. federally for by good old Donald Trump, who's not paying his legal bills. Cool. $10 million to other lawyers from the Save America PAC, but none for you. <laughs> maybe he'll, um, maybe he'll defend himself because that would be funny. <laughs> that would be outstanding. <laughs> That would be so great. Maybe we could get Alex Jones's lawyer to come in and <laughs> help him out. Steve Bannon is the kind of guy that would do that, though, isn't he? Isn't he the kind of guy that maybe would be like, I know more than you. I'm going to defend myself. I don't know. If he wants to be severally uh, responsible for sanctions, sure, go ahead. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, it's really great. It's always great to talk to you. Tell everybody where they can find you and read your stuff because it's just it's so well written. And and the interviews that you do on Prevail are so amazing. So we all know Prevail, the podcast, MSW Media Podcast. You can get it wherever you get your pods. But you've got other stuff going on. Where? I do. I was going to say I'm on this this lovely network of podcasts, which which is really good. And I have today because this is it's Friday today, right? Even though it's Thursday, it's Friday. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have today on the podcast, I have Jim Campbell who wrote um, Madoff Box. So we're talking about the whole Bernie Madoff thing, which is pretty, it's, it's a little bit of a departure from my usual thing, but it's, he's really cool. And it was, it was a pretty fun interview. Um, I have a Substack, which is gregoliar.substack.com. Um, please go subscribe to that, you know, and I have a show uh, called The Five Eight, which I do with my friend uh, Stephanie Koff, LB, Lincoln's Bible. That's at 8 o'clock Eastern, 5 o'clock Pacific uh, on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. So uh, that's going to be fun, too. That's today also. Friday's a busy day for me. Friday is a busy day. So I thank you for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us. Greg Oliar, you're you're my hero. Well, everybody, stick around. We'll be right back with the good news. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Good news, good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, if you want to play find the cat or what the mutt or you have shit kids say or shit you say or shit your parents say or a whoopee story, right? You're like a blankie that yeah, I, I carried a quilt around for most of my childhood that became that started out as a queen sized quilt and ended up like a little square because it just kept getting all gross. And my mom kept just making it smaller and smaller. Maybe that was a way to get rid of it. Now that I think about that, holy shit. Anyway, if you want to send any of that in or if you have a shout out to a loved one or a small business in your area, if you don't have pod pet tax, you can always show us an adoptable pet in your area. 
Send it into us at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. First up from Clay, pronouns he and him. Hi, AG, and in the spirit of DG. I work with an animal rescue in Nashville, Tennessee. We have two kitties who have been in and out of foster homes for five months, and it's time I called in some reinforcements. Cactus and Olive were abandoned together in a dog crate at five weeks old, and they're now about six or seven months. They're the perfect sibling pair, easygoing, quiet but playful, very sweet and loving. They've been spayed and neutered, vaccinated, microchipped. They're negative for FIV, F-E-L-V. They're truly a bonded pair, and it wouldn't be fair to separate them. The rescue is Forget Me Not, and you can reach out at forgetmenotrescue at gmail.com. Thank you for all you do and for helping us find them a forever home. We're ready to come home. We're a bonded brother and sister looking for our forever home. Look at these babies. It's like a, it's one of those sable tabbies, the beautiful markings, and a little void with a tiny little white patch on the chest, olive and cactus. So beautiful. After a few pets, we're ready to snuggle and love you forever. We love playing. We're the bestest buds who do everything together. We're six to seven months old and cannot wait for our forever home. So everybody, here they are. So adorable. Thank you so much for that. Next up from Gwen. Nothing important, but my part of the country is in a pocket of weirdly nice weather today. So Clancy had an exploration this evening. Tomorrow, inspired by you, instead of the radio news, I'll be listening to Flood while I get ready for work. Why is the world in love again? Oh, hi, Katie, up in the tree with your nice vest and harness. (laughs) he's cool look at this guy oh clancy great name thank you so much all right next up from anonymous no pronouns given hello beans queens i love your take on everything i must confess that i was on the dark side most of my adult life born and raised in it i even worked part-time for a particular turtle-like senator in my home commonwealth which was not a great experience weak handshake like a dead fish oh you know what that sounds like mitch I had my come to reality moment right before the 2015 primaries. I could no longer justify the Looney Tune actions of the party. Seeing so much blind support for a repulsive individual who should not be named, I had to ask myself, are we the baddies? (laughs) Now I am conformed, a little blue dot in a sea of red, trying to fix what I helped break. So please forgive me, fellow beings. It's been challenging with my family and friends who still listen to propaganda, but your reporting has helped me realize that I'm not alone and I can make a difference. Thank you for your service and fantastic contribution to promoting democracy and a progressive stance for future generations. For my what the mutt challenge, no answers, so you can get it wrong. No, 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 Anonymous, I can get it right. I present to you a floofer whom I bumped into at a dog park. This little doggo brought so much confusing joy to me that I had to share. I firmly believe in the golden rule of trying to be a decent human being, but that was challenged when I had the sudden selfish urge to take this dog with me. (laughs) Thankfully, I was able to control my emotions and restrain myself. With that expression, I assume that this gentle soul has a wonderful home already. That smile is contagious. In any case, keep up the excellent work and keep it sassy. Oh, look at, oh my God, what is that? It's like a little chihuahua pug Frenchy baby. I've never seen a dog like that before. That's intense. You guys seen a dog like this? this is the cutest dog you have next time you see this dog you have to find out what's in there and what this little guy's name is there's definitely pug maybe a little bulldog german shepherd something this is such a cool dog i've never seen a dog like this <sighs> so amazing thank you for sharing the, and the other one too look at oh so cute thank you next up from patty b during a recent good news segment i had a brilliant insight ag needs bespoke frog orgy artwork in her life. Oh my gosh. Yes, I do. I noodled on how to make this happen since I can't draw for beans. I realized that I live in the San Francisco Bay Area and know a bunch of freaky people who collectively know all the freaky people in the world. One of them will surely know an artist who would be up for this. I cast about on Facebook for leads and a friend immediately introduced me to someone. For the first time in human history, a conversation began between strangers and it started with, oh, hi, frog orgy? (laughs) Yeah, it's a gift for someone really cool who has a running joke about frog orgies on her podcast. He described his artistic vision of a frog orgy, and it was exactly what I was thinking of. Is it weird that two people had artistic visions of frog orgies, let alone perfectly aligned visions? Welcome to my bizarre life. I was confident that I'd found the right person when he started quizzing me about specific species of frogs and whether I had any preferences. 
My knowledge of the creatures is roughly what I learned in fourth grade and from Kermit, so I was way out of my depth. I punted. I trust your judgment, I said. We worked out some details, and I thanked him for being willing to handle this weird request from out of left field. Quote, I am Froghole the Clown. Weird is my middle name. Unquote. Yes, I definitely found the perfect artist. Soon I found myself holding the finished art with him pointing at specific frogs and identifying them. This one is a leopard frog. This guy's a toad. This is a little frog I saw in Mexico. And this is an axolotl because there's always an axolotl. Let the record show this was spontaneous, serendipitous axolotling. And I did not mention them at any point in our discussion. Oh my God. That's serendipity. That is synchronicity right there, my friend. I hope this puts a smile on your face. Signed, a longtime listener and patron, a recent connoisseur, a fine frog porn, Patty B. And I got it in the mail. I opened it just now and it is amazing. I'm including a picture of it. Oh, look at this. Look at that big guy right in the middle. This is fantastic. <laughs> I'm so happy they put, a, they put that in there brilliant. Thank you. This is, this is the coolest gift. I really appreciate this. Thank you so much, Patty. That's just, I'm so glad. And, and seriously, anonymous, whatever kind of dog that is, I got to know that is just an adorable little guy. And look at Clancy in the tree. So fantastic. And then of course, olive and cactus are available for all you folks who are looking for a bonded pair. So Thank you for sending in your good news. If you have any you want to send in, you can do it at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. Um, we'll be doing the bonus episodes this weekend. And then, of course, on uh, Sunday, you'll hear Jack. I'll be back Monday. Dana will be back Tuesday. I'm so very excited. I miss my friend. Until then, everybody, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Vote blue over Q and bring someone with you. I've been AG and them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. Season four of How We Win is here. For the past four years, we've been making history in critical elections all over the country. And last year, we made history again by expanding our majority in the Senate, beating election-denying Republicans in crucial state house races, and fighting back a non-existent red wave. But the MAGA Republicans who plotted and pardoned the attempted overthrow of our government now control the House thanks to gerrymandered maps and repressive anti-voter laws. And the chaotic spectacle we've already seen shows us just how far they will go to seize power, dismantle our government, and take away our freedoms. So the official podcast of The Persistence is back with season four. There's so much more important work ahead of us to fight for equity, justice, and our very democracy itself. We'll take you behind the lines and inside the rooms where it happens with strategy and inspiration from progressive changemakers all over the country. And we'll dig deep into the weekly news that matters most and what you can do about it with messaging and communications expert, co-founder of Way to Win, and our new co-host, Jennifer Fernandez Ancona. So join Steve and I every Wednesday for your weekly dose of inspiration, action, and hope. I'm Steve Pearson. And I'm Jennifer Fernandez Ancona. And And this this is is how we win. win.